Speak, God, <laughs> or speak to my heart, God. It's a good devotional. It, uh, I haven't checked to see how long it is, because when it's too long, I really can't read it that quick and share it, because it gets a little too long for a devotional, and maybe <laughs> becomes a full-fledged Bible study. Uh, but they're always good. I was thinking about, as I was recording these, that how much nicer it is to sit here at this time of day. And as I'm recording them, I've always mentioned that I like transparency. So these are being recorded for normally tomorrow, which by the time you see them will be today. <laughs> but God uses them in such a way that they are aptly fit for you and me on the day that we view them and hear them because he applies them to the circumstances of our life and he bears witness that way to cause it to be what some people call kismet but it's really his hand arranging your life to fit on the day that you see these that they will walk with you and it will be his word speaking to you so that you'll be prepared for what circumstances he already knows is happening in your life that day. And the way that you know that, or the way that you are comforted by that, is because he's God. He can know those things ahead of time and plan it accordingly. And that's why I never understood how some people you know, freak out on tornadoes or hurricanes or whatever. Well, he really knows that's going to happen? Come on now, get real. It's not like he suddenly woke up one day and said, Ah, I think I'll send a hurricane today. <laughs> Come on. He's already seen all that happen. He already knows all that's going to be accomplished and the purposes within it and all the intricacies and details. I mean, look at the ribonucleic acids and the DNA that you have. I mean, if he's that detailed to create you from those strands, then I'm sure that he can handle all the circumstances of everybody's life in the timelines that are all coordinated to be happening on occurring on the day that a tornado happens to blast through a town and wipe everything out. Can you? No. <laughs> you can't even get the data together, you know, to figure that one out. But he knows. It's simple. He's, he does know. And so I hate it when a pastor ducks the question, Well, does God send the tornado? Did God, you know, cause this? Is he judging us? Come on, if you got to ask if he's judging you, he probably is. <laughs> if he's not, cool. <laughs> Duck and run. <laughs> But in our day, as we set our mind to ask him what is in store, we choose to trust him with our life. And that's what makes him Lord of our life and not just a religious idea. Because doctrines and dogmas and ideas are fine for people that want religion. But when you want to hear what God has to say, you have to actually ask him, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? When you're locked in a prison of difficult circumstances, have people, things, or circumstances robbed you of your joy? That's right. Yep. Did you know that no matter what comes your way in the course of your life, you can have joy? Joy, no matter what? Does this sound like a pipe dream or some spiritual fantasy? <laughs> well, it's not. In fact, the book of Philippians assures us that joy, no matter what, can become a reality for those who would grasp this truth and live accordingly. Paul wrote to the Philippians while he was a prisoner of Rome, imprisoned for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in a short but powerfully practical letter to them, Paul uses the word joy or rejoice 16 times. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Philippians 1, 12 and 18. All prisons are not concrete cells with steel bars and iron doors. Some people are imprisoned in an unhappy marriage, living with a selfish, indifferent, or even cruel mate. Others find themselves locked into an unhappy, hard, difficult, or seemingly impossible situation. Or the captivity may be a physical one, imprisoned in a body that will not function as it ought to. 
As a quadriplegic, my friend Joni Erickson Tata lives in this type of prison. And yet because of her joy, her prison has become a platform for the gospel and the sufficiency of Christ. And the joy of the Lord has become her strength. And if you found yourself in such a prison, would the joy of the Lord become your strength? Would you have the key to unlock that prison and step out into the joy of the Lord? The key to having joy, no matter what is found in the prison of Jesus Christ and in the mindset or attitude that is submissive to his will, Christ is mentioned 36 times in Philippians, not counting all the other nouns or pronouns that refer to him, and mind or attitude is used 10 times. In other words, it's in Jesus Christ that we have that joy. In Philippians 1.21, Paul tells us that Christ is his very life. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain, he said. Paul's joy was not centered in his freedom from prison, whatever form that imprisonment might take. Rather, his joy was wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. Christ was his life. Therefore, it did not matter whether he was locked up or free, for his life was consumed by one desire. According to my earnest expectation and hope, I will not be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or whether by death. Philippians 1.20 Whatever God wanted to do with Paul was all right, for Paul's heart and mind was set on one thing, God's will for him. Paul knew God, not man, held the key to his prison doors. God shuts and God opens. Paul's life was so consumed with the love of Christ that he actually preferred to die and be with his God. Philippians 1, 22-26. However, Paul also knew that his imprisonment was for the further progress of the gospel. 1, 12. Oh, dear child of God, whatever you are enduring now, or whatever comes your way in the future, it is not without purpose in the sovereignty of God. If you will let Christ be your life, and if you have submissive mind towards God, allowing him to be God, you will have joy. And your joy, in spite of the imprisonment, whatever you're going through, will be used by God to reach others. As I write this, God has brought one of our dear precept trainers to mind, a young, attractive wife and mother who is also extremely gifted as a teacher. When this young woman discovered that she had multiple sclerosis, she wrote to me saying, God knew that if he chose for me to live in a wheelchair, I would seek to do so to his glory. Through it all, God is teaching me to live a more disciplined life. He has given me another area in which I must live in total dependence upon him, and in some ways I feel my walking through the situation will benefit others. As I prayed one day, I simply spoke 2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 9. I am hard pressed on every side, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I told God that would be my theme, but he said no. The song of my heart was to be found further on down in that chapter in verses 15 through 18. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Truly, my precious friend and co-laborer has joy. Joy no matter what. Pray through Philippians 1, substituting your circumstances for Paul's. Make his desire yours. Practice having his mindset and claim the joy that will be yours. And know this, your life shall then have a greater eternal impact. Read the book of Philippians. And mark each use of joy or rejoice, Christ, mind, or attitude. Then write down what you have learned from marking each word. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. You know, I understand more than most because I spent 10 years of my life in hospital beds, and I spent most of my life suffering through the diseases that ravaged my body and fighting through the misconceptions that people had of a person who isn't obviously disabled, unless you can see it when I was down to 89 pounds and suffering. But the mental anguish, the agony of spirit, the turmoil of soul when people that in those days, as well as in today's 
modern era with evangelicals wanted to heal you or wanted to say that there was sin in your life or wanted to do all these things when God wanted to accomplish for his eternal glory the grace worked out in my life that I should be joyful in my sufferings and I should be proud and wearing them like a banner. And that's what God did in my life because I had my Bible. I had my strong concordance. I, <laughs> I had songs of deliverance. I was singing at times and sharing in places where you would not think that a Christian would dare to say that this is a successful Christian? A man dying and told he would not live past 30? And what is he doing? <laughs> talking about Jesus? Are you crazy? And yet, God caused me to live. And then he took me to health, and now he's taken me to weakness again, as my back is out and I'm suffering. But you know, <laughs> even as you see me laughing and giggling about it, you can, I know you don't believe me, unless you've experienced it, but you can have joy even in the death of your loved one or the loss of a child or the agony of you know your mother or father or someone gone because the reality is none of what you're experiencing is half of what you think it is but what you haven't seen is so much greater and you don't know it yet so when you do see it you'll just look back on it and start giggling if you want to call it that or laughing or having joy because God gave you some glimpse of heaven so that you could pass through this world without ever being agonizing again over what you think you see as being important when what you can't see is the most important thing in the universe you may think where you're at right now with what you see is the most important thing in the world but this world isn't your home <laughs> you are destined for so much more and wait till you see it then you're gonna love it